This is Joe Schrader, firefighter paramedic with the Vancouver Fire Department. Today I'm going to be teaching a trauma overview as well as some changes that we've made to our trauma kit and our triage bag. Just an overview of the course. We're going to be uh, talking about some evidence-based medicine, TECC guidelines, phases of care, uh, the March principles, assessment and interventions, specific injuries, and then the changes to both kits. Just a background on uh, where this all came from. Uh, with cardiac care, it's uh, all driven by evidence-based medicine. That's something that we hear often. And uh, the driving force of that is ACLS. And any time something changes in the industry it, uh, with science, it quickly uh, works its way into the field. And so we're, we're often making changes to the, our CPR guidelines and such. With trauma, uh, PHTLS is, is the driving force. And uh, although the, the changes don't happen quite as, uh, as fast as with ACLS, and there's an arm to PHTLS, which is tactical combat casualty care. And that's what the military uses for um, trauma care. They're treating mainly penetrating injuries on the battlefield. And there's a lot of evidence-based medicine coming out of there, but it's not move, working its way to the um, civilian pre-hospital setting very fast. Uh, there's two distinct phases of care in pre-hospital medicine. There's the on-scene phase, which is uh, the initial arriving units uh, do the life-saving interventions, basically stabilizing the ABCs, and then immobilizing and packaging the patient. Our goal is 10 minutes on-scene. And then there's the transport phase. Uh, that's where we're going to stabilize the patient further, uh, start IVs, uh, if we need to establish a definitive airway, that's the time to do it. Uh, and then pain management and splinting and reassessing the patient. For pre-hospital trauma care, it really can be looked at as pre-surgical care. What can we do uh, in the pre-hospital setting before the patient gets to the hospital to give them the best chance of survival, uh, surviving first surgery? And, uh, and that stabilization, and then their, um, their recovery. The overall goal really is uh, to save red blood cells. And that's going to help us to oxygenate the patient and prevent shock. So any and all bleeding should be controlled in these patients' external bleeding, because uh, whether it's arterial or venous blood, it's still blood, and uh, we need to save every red blood cell. So um, in a sense, the focus is really on BLS level skills, especially in that on-scene phase. Tactical emergency casualty care is a version of uh, tactical combat casualty care. And uh, it's sort of the civilian version that uh, there were some slight changes made for law enforcement, you know, mainly SWAT teams. That, that were a little more applicable for the civilian environment. And there's really three f identified uh, preventable battlefield deaths that the military identified looking back at um, several different conflicts and, and the casualties. 85% uh, of those preventable battlefield deaths were hemorrhage. 50% was extremity hemorrhages, and that's where the the emphasis on tourniquet use really came out of. 10% uh, was tension pneumothorax, and then 1% was airway injuries. Uh, there's three phases of care in TECC. There's care under fire or direct threat care. That's where uh, in the combat environment you're taking effective fire from a threat, and uh, you're performing self-aid or buddy aid. Uh, or, or directing that type of aid for someone else. And really, you can't perform any, any more treatments until you can get, get away from that threat. This isn't really applicable, obviously, for uh, fire-based EMS, hopefully. 
Uh, the second phase is tactical field care. That's the on-scene phase, that, that 10 minutes that we arrive on scene. And for uh, fire-based, non-transporting EMS, that's really where uh, our emphasis should be, is on that, that on-scene phase, stabilizing that patient and preparing them for transport. And then the third phase is the evacuation care transport phase. So that would be obviously transporting the patient in the ambulance to the hospital. The MARCH principles is a, an acronym or, or a, a just guideline for the assessment and, and treatment of, of traumatic injuries. It's kind of the ABCs of trauma, really. And, and although it was, um, it, was, it was put together mainly for penetrating trauma, it really can work for, for any trauma assessment, that initial assessment of the patient. It really guides what, what in, interventions can be done on scene, whether this is a, a penetrating trauma, somebody that's been shot, or it's a car accident, or an elderly fall victim that was found in their bathroom. This assessment really is gonna identify those um, treatable uh, injuries that need to be managed on scene. So the M stands for massive bleeding. This is going to be the exsanguinating hemorrhage that we can see walking up to the patient or, or find you know, quickly. There's going to be an arterial bleed. And again, our, one of our main priorities is to save red blood cells. So when you are faced with massive bleeding, tourniquet is, is uh, the most appropriate management of that. And the emphasis of tourniquets has really, over the last decade, really come to the forefront, whereas it used to be considered a, a very last-ditch effort. If, if all else had failed, then you would go to the tourniquet. By that time, your patient has already bled out. So uh, considering life over limb, tourniquets should really be used as the first-line management of these, these significant bleeds. Uh, for injuries that, that you can't apply a tourniquet to because it's a junctional wound, um, not on the extremities, rather. There's wound packing, and that's mainly for junctional wounds. We'll talk about that a little bit later in this class, and there will be a, a skills presentation for that. The A, a stands for airway in March. Uh, it's going to be the management, assessment and management of the airway. Uh, initially, the, the best adjuncts for that is the NPA or, or OPA if the patient doesn't have a gag reflex. Uh, you can also consider the eye gel. These are quick things that we can do on scene. They don't take much time and it can be, be done by one person in a few seconds just to open up that airway temporarily. And then the definitive airways would be the endotracheal tube. If none of these are effective, then, then we go to the surgical airway. The R is for respirations. It's going to be injuries to the chest or, uh, or ineffective breathing, basically. So uh, with the assessment of the chest, we're going to look at um, look for penetrating chest injuries, and, and we want to seal all those holes with, with a chest seal. And then uh, if, we suspect needle de uh, if we suspect attention pneumothorax, then we go right to needle decompression of that side. And then um, BVM assist for the patient that's not uh, ventilating adequately on their own. The C is circulation. That's going to be where we identify all bleeding, not just the massive bleeding. And we're going to bandage those injuries with a compression bandage or the normal means. Abdominal seals for abdominal injuries, uh, covering eye injuries and then uh, the initial treatment of burns. The H stands for head and hypothermia. So for head, it's going to be assessing the AVPU and GCS of the patient. And then for hypothermia, the key to uh, treat, treating hypothermia is really preventing it from happening. So you really have to start early. And hypothermia is uh, a major contributor to mortality in trauma patients. And uh, once, it, once it gets started, then it's really difficult to catch up, especially in the patient that's not perfusing well because of, of trauma. So we really have to be on top of that, and that really should start on scene. And then 
Another thing that you can add to this is splinting. You could even change the acronym to MARCHES, but the, the standard is MARCH. So uh, splinting is another consideration on scene, though. That, that includes cervical spinal immobilization and applying a pelvic sling if you suspect a pelvic injury, and then extremity splinting. So breaking these down uh, with massive bleeding, we're going to identify this with a rapid head-to-toe blood sweep. Uh, this isn't a uh, detailed trauma exam, head-to-toe trauma exam. We're just sweeping the body looking for massive bleeding. When we find it, we stop and we treat it. If it's an extremity, we apply a tourniquet. If, uh, if it's anywhere else on the body, we can consider wound packing or a compression bandage or direct pressure, the normal means, direct pressure, pressure points, uh, pressure dressing, and then the tourniquet and wound packing. Uh, there's real emphasis on addressing the bleeding at its source, not just the hole. We're not just going to cover a hole with gauze that we see blood coming out of. We really want to address it at that, that source of bleeding, the, the vessel that's bleeding. You know, that, that source has a name, and we need to address it at that source, whether it's an artery or a vein. We need to get in there and, and control it. Applying tourniquets, there's a few different techniques or, or types of tourniquets. Uh, in the Vancouver Fire Department, we carry the CAT or the Combat Application Tourniquet, but there are, there are many different tourniquets on the market. Uh, a hasty tourniquet is basically applying the tourniquet as high as you can and as tight as you can on the extremity, whether it's an amputated hand or uh, arterial bleed in the lower or upper arm, we're still going to apply the tourniquet high on the extremity. The benefits of this is the artery is largest in the upper extremity, it's close to the surface, and it's running along one bone. So it's, it's much easier to tamponade. In the lower extremity, you have multiple arteries. They're deeper um, and covered by tissue, and there's two bones in the lower arm and leg. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that a tourniquet that's placed for two hours or less has little to no chance of causing any tissue or vascular damage to the extremity. You're going to place and secure the tourniquet, removing all slack out of the, out of the tourniquet strap before tightening the tourniquet down. And then you're going to turn the windlass bar until it cannot be turned anymore or until the bleeding stops. And then you're going to secure the tourniquet in place. With legs, uh, a significant bleed, arterial bleed in the leg often requires more than one tourniquet. And in that case, if the first tourniquet isn't adequate in controlling bleeding, then the second tourniquet will be applied directly below the first one, essentially making a, a larger, wider tourniquet. It's going to cover more surface area. Tourniquets are very painful. And so with a patient that is even semi-conscious, you're going to need to plan for pain management, or the patient's going to be trying to remove that tourniquet. For wound packing, this is directional pressure. We're, we're packing wounds that are junctional wounds too high in the axillary or inguinal area on the upper arm or legs. It's too high to apply a tourniquet, and so we need other means to, to control the bleeding at its source. With wound packing, we have uh, gauze that's made. It's, it's basically just unrolled curlix that is, is in a bag, and you can stuff it into the wound. We'll have a video later to show that technique. And then once that gauze is placed in the wound, then we hold pressure, very, very heavy pressure against that, that gauze for a minimum of three minutes, no peaking. This gauze is not impregnated with a hemostatic agent like some combat dressings are. Uh, it, here in Vancouver, we, we use a, just a standard Curlex gauze. Once the bleeding is, is, uh, is controlled, then we're going to 
put a compression bandage over that, that gauze that's been placed in the wound. The trunk of the body is, is considered a compartment, the chest and thoracic cavity, the abdom, abdomen. Uh, we don't want to blindly pack those wounds with gauze because you're, you're potentially just packing gauze into the, into the chest cavity or abdomen. And, and for obvious reasons, that's not a good idea. Uh, however, if, if you do have an arterial bleed in, in an open wound in the chest and that artery seems to be in the chest wall, you can attempt to pack that wound and, and control the bleeding. Um, you're, you're, in that case, you're packing against other structures, and so you're going to be able to control that bleeding. For airway, uh, initially we're going to clear the airway of any obstructions. That could be teeth, blood, chew, uh, any foreign bodies. And then we're going to protect that airway. We want to keep it open. So the progression of airway control is to evaluate the airway, open and clear it, and then protect it. And our options for, for manually protecting the airway are beyond head tilt, chin lift, or, or the modified jaw thrust, or the, the NPA, the OPA, or the eye gel, and then endotracheal tube and surgical crike. If you're thinking you need to do a surgical crike, then you should probably do it. The thing that takes the longest with, with doing a surgical crike is just making that decision that, that you actually need to do it. So if it's in your mind, then you should probably be doing it. With a any airway control, plan for failure. Always have a backup plan. What are you going to do if the intervention you're attempting doesn't work? Once you've controlled the airway, you want to improve oxygenation. Uh, with ventilation and then perform your procedures. For respirations, we're going to assess the rate, quality, and depth of uh, ventilation. Cover any holes that you find. That includes the neck and um, the upper chest and then also upper abdomen because if, if there's penetrating trauma, you don't know the path that that, that hole is going. It can be going into the thoracic cavity and leading to a tension pneumothorax. So cover the holes and then support ventilations. The chest seal uh, options that you have are the Asherman chest seal, which is a vented seal. It has an adhesive backing, and then in the middle of it, there's a, a one-way flutter valve. Essentially, that's placed over the wound and allows air to, to escape um, from the chest out that, that vent. The other option is an unvented seal. And one of the best chest seals that we have available to us is the defib pad. It's, it's made to, to stick to hairy, sweaty, bloody skin and um, has, has that gel that, that does really well. So. It also covers a large surface area. We carry them in all of our monitors. Uh, if you have an expired chest or expired defib pad, rather than throwing it away, you can put it in your trauma kit along with your Asherman chest seal and have that as a second option. And uh, an option that you can do is, is place that seal, just cut the, the cable off, and then draw an X on the pad. And that'll help the hospital staff to, to uh, not be confused that there's defib pads on a trauma patient. Always check for an exit wound. If you have a gunshot or penetrating wound to the, the chest, you know, always check the back. And then also the axillary area underneath the armpit. Oftentimes you can miss uh, small gunshot wounds and penetrating trauma in the, that area. And then anytime you consider uh, that the patient may have an, a tension pneumothorax, and we should be doing a needle decompression. PHTLS standards no longer recommend a one-way flutter valve. Uh, you don't need to put on a, a three-way stopcock or a flutter valve or anything else. Uh, that, you're essentially converting that tension pneumothorax to a simple pneumothorax by placing the, the decompression needle. There's also some studies that have shown and, and experienced that um, for people that have, have done a few chest decompressions, this is really a temporary 
intervention for attention pneumothorax. The catheter that we use is a 14 gauge needle. It's a pretty small opening and that hole can become obstructed by blood or tissue once it's placed. So it really is just going to initially decompress that, that pleural space. But um, definitively, this patient needs a chest tube once they get to the hospital. In Clark County, the standard is uh, for, for a chest decompression is in the second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. Remember to always go over the rib. Underneath every rib is an artery, a vein, and a nerve. So we always ride over the rib and then place the needle in the pleural space. And then remove the, the needle, leaving the catheter in place. And, and secure it. It also, uh, leaving it in place, even if it becomes obstructed, it helps to uh, let the hospital staff know that uh, decompression has been performed or how many have been performed if you have a couple of them next to each other. So you may have to uh, perform a second one. For circulation, we're going to recheck and control all bleeding. Uh, placing compression bandages if, if you have a, a significant injury to an extremity that you placed a tourniquet on. This is the time where we're actually going to bandage that wound with, uh, with a compression bandage or cling or whatever you consider. The options for the compression bandage is the bulky curlex that we carry or a 5x9 pad with an ACE wrap bandage that we'll go over a little later. The other option is the Israeli bandage. This is a uh, pre-made compression bandage that has a large uh, pad attached to it, to the elastic bandage. It also has a pressure bar to apply a little extra pressure over that, that wound. The op there's the option for wound packing these, these injuries, especially to extremities. And then reassessing these tourniquets, are they still effective? Once we place a tourniquet, because we're in the urban setting, the patient's going to be to definitive care, hopefully in less than an hour. We're not really going to do tourniquet conversions or rotating tourniquets or any of those things that, that you may see in, in the extended care austere environment or in, in the, the battlefield. And then we're also going to evaluate head injuries, eye injuries, abdominal injuries, an evisceration, open abdominal injury burns, and then pelvic injuries. We carry the SAM pelvic sling to stabilize uh, suspected pelvic fractures, and it's best to place that before the patient is immobilized on a backboard. It's a lot easier to get it on to them before they're secured to the backboard. And then there really needs to be an emphasis that transport should never be delayed to establish an IV. If the patient is hypotensive and showing signs of shock, the IV is only going to prolong or, or delay the treatment that they need, which is definitive surgical care. So these patients should not be sitting on scene in the back of the ambulance. Once they get in the back of the ambulance, they should be en route to the hospital. And if, they're, if help is needed, then uh, you know, obviously more, more people can ride in and get those IVs en route. For head and hypothermia, we're going to assess the AVPU and GCS to uh, identify potentially any closed head injuries. For hypothermia, reemphasis, uh, you know, prevention is the key. Keep these patients warm. If if it's a February night that's rainy and the patient's laying on the wet ground, just getting them up off the ground on a backboard will really help to prevent them from losing body heat through the ground. Removing wet clothing and then covering the patient with a blanket, even just the yellow highway blanket will, will do a lot to just get that wind chill off of them. Hypothermia increases the risks of coagulopathy, the body's inability to form blood clots. Risk factors include trauma, alcohol, the environment and age, and a lot of those are, are, are multiple of those are, are considerations during a lot of our traumas. During the transport phase, we're going to reassess on-scene interventions that were performed, airway management, tourniquets, uh, definitive airway control. This is the time to do that if we need to do an RSI. 
This is where we're going to do the detailed head-to-toe exam, not just the, the blood sweep uh, identifying the, the March principles, but now we're going to do a detailed head-to-toe exam. Establish vascular access. The target for the blood pressure is, is 90. Uh, for patients, especially patients with head injuries, we don't want the blood pressure to get below that. Uh, for other trauma, there's a lot of, of science and evidence um, out there suggesting uh, permissive hypotension and um, allowing the patient's blood pressure to be a little lower, which is a natural body um, response to trauma to uh, decrease the pressure on newly formed clots. It also uh, hypotension stimulates the, the liver to uh, release clotting factors into the, into the bloodstream. We don't want to artificially increase the blood pressure with normal saline, which is typically cold below the core temperature of the body. It does not transport oxygen and essentially just dilutes blood. So uh, we need to be cautious with our fluid challenges. Fluid challenge should be for hypovolemia. Really, it's just uh, to reverse the signs of shock, signs and symptoms of shock. For pain management, fentanyl is our, our main uh, pain medication that we carry in Clark County. It has a very wide safety margin, not like uh, morphine that had the tendency to, to drop the blood pressure. Fentanyl has a much more safe um, margin. And uh, so with patients with, with trauma, we can consider giving small amounts of fentanyl and, and titrate to, to effect and, and to blood pressure. Pain management is associated with uh, better overall patient outcomes. There's been studies that have shown that pre-hospital pain management has contributed to shorter hospital stays and, and less overall pain medicines that the patient required during recovery. During the transport phase, we want to do splinting for any fractures, dislocations, and then treat for shock. So just a to recap, you know, the, the goal really is pre-surgical care, not just pre-hospital care. And we want to save red blood cells, save every red blood cell. They transport oxygen, they transport um, all of the, the things that are going to prevent this patient from going into shock. Shock really is global tissue hypoxia secondary to hypoperfusion. So we want to increase perfusion and uh, really increase oxygenation for a, a patient that's in profound shock, they may need their airway secured and, and they need to be ventilated by a BVM to increase their oxygenation. And then we want to prevent the lethal triad. That's coagulopathy, hypothermia, and acidosis. These things work together and, and compound each other. So we really want to prevent all of them. So the changes to the, the trauma kit that we've made, it, it really for a long time was considered a BLS kit and for the most part was left on the rig. Uh, it really is a standalone trauma kit, specific trauma kit. Things that have been removed from it are the um, IV supplies and the BLS meds. Those meds are now carried in the, the medical kit as well as the IV supplies are in there. Uh, with it being, an, there being an emphasis on, on the trauma so supplies We've added more bleeding control equipment and chest decompression needles have been added to the trauma kit, taken from the airway bag and put in the trauma kit. Uh, we're going to go over these changes here in, in a bit later on in this class. Uh, for the triage bag, triage bag is kind of based on the March principles that we went over. And uh, the triage bag now has tourniquets, Israeli bandages, wound packing gauze, and chest decompression needles, as well as the triage equipment and some, some extra um, airway adjuncts, MPAs and OPAs. This is a bag that, that you don't need to wait for that multiple patient scene or, or MCI to grab this bag. This bag can be, uh, can, can be carried you know, to any trauma, obviously, and, and it's going to just complement the trauma kit because it, it's carrying the same supplies. So you're, you'll have more of it with if you do have multiple patients. Okay, now we're going to be 
talking about the changes that we've made to the trauma kit. Uh, one of the things we did is uh, have labeled the kit uh, with a reflective labeling uh, just to help identify, one, the, the kit and the unit that it belongs to, but then also um, we're going over, or, or this, this helps if, if there's multiple units on scene and uh, we're operating out of this kit, it, it could possibly uh, help with uh, identifying what unit is uh, in a treatment area. So uh, there's, there's labels to say fire and then the, the unit designation, this being rescue two. So uh, some of the changes that we've made are uh, removing the I, all of the IV supplies, IV fluids, and then also all the BLS meds have been pulled out of the kits. And then uh, burn sheets just to, to make room for the trauma supplies that, that we've added and then being able to carry more. So um, in the main compartment down here in the back, we've got um, two of the large trauma bandages. Uh, some of the kits still have burn sheets, one burn sheet, one trauma pad, and I really don't know uh, what is the better option. But on the, the inventory list, it shows two trauma pads of the large trauma pads. And then there's a pair of um, eye protection. These are for uh, the rescuer, but then also uh, can be used for the patient to manage an eye injury, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit on uh, ways that you can do that. And then there's a bottle of sterile water for irrigation in the back here. And then we have ACE wraps. This is a, an elastic bandage that has a Velcro closure on it. There's six of the six inch wraps and then there's six of the three inch wraps. And they both are uh, the same length, uh, just a, a different width. This is the Israeli bandage and I'll open one up and show a couple different techniques on how to use it. It's a six inch bandage. It actually is called the emergency bandage um, or trauma wound dressing, but it is uh, affectionately known as the Israeli bandage. That's kind of the, the common term. Uh, a lot of the local law enforcement carries this bandage as well, so it's, it's a common bandage that you might see um, out there. And then there's one of the burn face masks. This is, uh, to place on a patient that has a burn to the face and it's almost like a sham wow. What you can do is open up the packaging and pour in some, some uh, sterile water, sterile saline, and, and that'll kind of permeate the, the mask and then the mask can be placed on the patient. Also in this pocket is four five by nine gauze pads that can be used um, for, for making a compression bandage or whatever else. We've got some ice packs and then a stethoscope and BP cuff here in this pocket. And then we've got the wound packing gauze. It comes in two different packaging. One is called the Z-Pack dressing and it's four and a half inches by 4.1 yards. It's just gauze that's basically Z-packed into this rather than uh, rolled like a Curlex bandage. The other one is the S-rolled gauze. So it's just different manufacturers, but essentially it's the same thing. Once you open up the, the vacuum sealed bag, there's a smaller pouch that the gauze is in. You can take it out almost like a ribbon and start stuffing it into the wound. And that'll protect the rest of the gauze so it doesn't get dirty or bloody on the ground. And then we have two of the combat application tourniquets. These are field stripped, removed out of their plastic packaging and really the tab should even be over because if we're placed in a tourniquet, time is of the essence and, and we wanna be quick. So we're gonna, we're gonna place this tourniquet fast. We don't wanna take the time to have to remove it out of its plastic packaging. So there's two tourniquets in here, ring cutter and some Coban. On the front page, we've got alcohol preps, some surgical lubrication, uh, helpful for removing wing, uh, rings or uh, other jewelry. We've got some one inch cloth tape and two inch cloth tape. A pen light, a few extra pairs of gloves, some hand clean wipes and band-aids. On the back page, we've got just the standard Curlex rolls, four of those, four triangular bandages, got eye pads, some medical razors for uh, shaving the chest if, we're, if we need to apply uh, a uh, chest seal, and then iodine to prep the chest if we're gonna do a chest decompression. 
and then um, a 10 gauge or 10 cc syringe for for uh, aspiration when we're doing a chest decompression. Got a handful or stack of four by four gauze back here. Two chest decompression needles. This is the ARS needle. Um, it's made by Northern or North American Rescue Products. And uh, it's a 14 gauge needle, three and a quarter inches long. And it's in this nice protective container. And then um, it, it's also a reinforced catheter, so it's, it's not going to uh, potentially bunch up on the chest when you're trying to insert it into the, through the skin and through the muscle. So it's, it's a reinforced needle specifically made for chest decompression. And then over here we've got the Asherman chest seal. You may have two Asherman chest seals. Um, you may also have an expired defib pad in, in your trauma kit if, if somebody's placed one in here. So that's where the chest um, seals are going to be. So that is the, uh, the layout of the, the new trauma kit. And then for the, the triage bag, we've got two of the cat tourniquets plus a ratchet tourniquet, which is a little bit longer. And then we've got um, wound packing gauze, either the S rolled or the Z pack dressing, Israeli dressings, some five by nines, some airway adjuncts and some chest seals in there along with all the triage tags and such. Okay, now I'm gonna be going over some of the specific supplies and how to use them uh, that, that we have new to this kit. So first we'll talk about the Israeli bandage. Uh, on, on the packaging it says the emergency bandage. It's also called the, the trauma wound dressing, but it's, it's main uh, name that it's known by is the Israeli bandage. Like I said, a lot of the local law enforcement carries this bandage. Um, officers are carrying them on in their individual first aid kit that might be on their, their uh, external body armor in a, in a container. And then also a lot of them have a, a tourniquet. So in this <clears throat> packaging, it's vacuum sealed. So once you tear off the tab, it's open, but it's not really open yet. Um, the, the bandage is then in a, a clear packaging, so you have to open that up as well. And then, and then you have the bandage, it's an elastic bandage, and when you first unroll it, you have your pad, that's basically a five by nine gauze pad that's attached to the bandage. And then there's a piece of thread that's, that's th through this, this uh, roll so that if you were to let go of it, it's not just gonna unravel and, and get into the mud or whatever else, so that, that string is really easy to break. And then the bandage on the top, it has this pressure bar, and I'll show you how to use this. This just helps to apply more downward pressure on the wound when you're controlling bleeding. And then at the end of the roll, there's a, a plastic closure bar to secure the bandage in place. There's a couple different uh, ways to use this bandage, and, and it's pretty beneficial for controlling bleeding, especially on extremities or, or the chest. Uh, and, and uh, controlling bleeding on, on amputations, it's, it's pretty effective, so. <clears throat> the other option for a, a compression bandage is the, the ACE wrap that we carry. <clears throat> this is the six inch wrap. We also carry the three inch wrap. It's in a plastic packaging. The best way to open this, rather than kind of picking on the ends, is just twist it and pop it open on this red line here. And, uh, and it just pops open and then you can slide the, band, the bandage out. So you may use a five by nine or a, some of the wound packing gauze on the wound as the bulky dressing, and then we're gonna uh, use this ACE wrap as the compression bandage. And with a new bandage that has not been used yet, it, it's got a lot of elasticity, a lot of stretch to it. So you can wrap the bandage up. And then at the end of it, there's a Velcro closure that you can use, or there's a few other techniques to secure that in place that we'll talk about. <clears throat> For the wound packing gauze, we have the Z pack dressing or the S rolled gauze, and this again is vacuum sealed. Once you open it up, um, the, the bag or the outside packaging, then there's this, this smaller bag that's inside, it's a clear bag, and then the gauze is just in here, just stuffed in. So you can start to pull it out and, and as you remove it from this 
packaging, you can stuff it into the wound, and we'll have a, a video to show you that particular technique. And, uh, and this packaging just gives you the ability to, to keep the dressing clean until it's in the wound. Or you can just remove it all out of the bag and, and just have a large bulky dressing that you can stuff over the wound and hold in place. And that's going to just give you a lot of gauze to, to control bleeding to then bandage over with a compression bandage. The next thing we're going to talk about is the tourniquet. This is the combat application tourniquet. Blue is for training out of our training kit. The, the tourniquet that's in the, the trauma kits is black. Those ones should not be used for training. Uh, if you want to train with one, you can request these through the trained division and, uh, and play with the blue ones. The, the makeup of this tourniquet is uh, there's an internal strap that runs from end to end, and that's what tightens with the windless bar. It just pulls that strap once it's, it's in place. So that's one of the main reasons why you don't want to use the black strap, uh, tourniquet for training, because it kind of jacks up that internal strap and is going to make it not be as, quite as effective. But the way that it's, it's preloaded and it's going to come out of the kit is this strap is going to be running through the first part of the buckle, the inside part of the buckle. And if you're placing this tourniquet over the arm, the upper extremity, you don't need to run the strap through the second part of the buckle. There's going to be enough Velcro attached that, it, that it's going to be um, secured and it's not going to come undone as you're tightening it. When you're placing this tourniquet over a lower extremity, some people may have large, um, larger legs, larger thighs, and there's not going to be as much Velcro attached. So on a, on a leg, you are going to want to pass this buckle or the strap through the second part of the back buckle and then pull your slack out and secure in place. <clears throat> it's pre-rigged so that you can just open it up and slide the tourniquet up the extremity. Or you can remove the, the strap out of the buckle and then, and then secure it. But it's best if you work with the, the strap facing outward because it's easier to pull it and, and place. So remove all the slack out of the, the strap. Bring it around on itself to capture all the Velcro. And then you're going to begin to tighten this windless bar. And you're going to continue to tighten it till you cannot tighten it anymore or until bleeding stops. Once that's happened, then you can secure the, strap, the bar inside one of the buckles and then, and then place the, the Velcro closure over the buckle. I know I'm kind of blocking uh, your ability to see what I'm doing. If I swing it around a little bit here, give the camera a better view of it. You come around <coughs> to this, this closure bar and then tighten the, the windless bar. You can place it on either side. And then something you can do on the arm, because there's so much strap left over, you don't want to get this hung up when you're moving the patient and blow out the tourniquet. So you can, although this isn't required, you can pass the rest of this strap through the closure bar there, and then secure it in place. Now, if it gets caught on something hung up, this isn't going to blow out the tourniquet and remove it. So that's just something that you can do. And then just kind of pack this around, get it out of the way. You, wanna, you can do this over the, the clothing. Remember, this is an exsanguinating hemorrhage. We need to get this tourniquet on as quickly as possible. So just going over the clothing as high as you can and as tight as you can on the extremity. And then write the time on this white um, band here of when the tourniquet was applied. For applying the tourniquet to the, the leg, you can use the same technique Something that you can do if, uh, if you walk up to this patient and you can see that there's a significant hemorrhage in the leg and, uh, and is bleeding out, you can come in and quickly you can drop a knee into the groin area over the femoral artery and you can temporarily do a pressure point 
um, blocking that femur up against the, or, or basically penning it against the pelvis. And, and that'll help to slow the bleeding down until you can get the tourniquet on. When you're placing the tourniquet on the leg, same thing, you can either come up the leg or you can remove the strap out of the buckle and go all the way around. Bring the strap back through that first part of the buckle and then the second part. And when you do this, it's gonna get kind of grabby, but you still wanna remove all the slack out of that tourniquet and then bring it around. And so now you're covering a larger limb. You don't have as much go, um, strap left over. Once you've done that, then you can tighten this tourniquet down, lock it into place. If you do have any more strap, you can pass it through the buckle again, but again, that's not necessary or, or required, and then put it in place. Now we're gonna reassess. Do we have bleeding controlled? or do we need to apply a second tourniquet? If we do need to apply a second tourniquet, then it's gonna go directly below the first one on the extremity, still high and, and tight. These tourniquets are about an inch and a half in diameter, or their width. So now essentially you have a three inch wide tourniquet covering more surface area. And so this one would be placed just the same as the first one, removing all of the slack out of it, and then you're gonna secure it in place. So now you have both tourniquets on. Now as we work our way down the march principles and we get to circulation, we can actually bandage up this wound on the extremity. Right now we're just trying to control the bleeding, stop that flow of blood. All right, now I'm gonna talk about uh, actually placing the Israeli bandage and the, the best way to do that. Uh, there's a couple different techniques and, and different ways to use it. And uh, so we'll talk about that. So the Israeli bandage, once you've removed it from the packaging, this packaging could be used uh, in a pinch as a chest seal. You just tear it open the rest of the way, tape it to the chest, it's a nice thick package or you can Toss it to the side. This bandage, <clears throat> uh, you get it out of the outside packaging, you gotta remove it out of the clear packaging. And again, it's got a large pad that's attached to it. There's a sticker on the outside that says other side to wound. You can basically place that sticker over the main part of the wound. If, if you have an injury to, uh, to the forearm, let's say, on this individual, You place the, the bandage over the wound and bring this, this uh, end part around. Now we're gonna wrap around the, the bandage. Obviously, in the real world, I would have gloves and eye protection on and everything, but I'm not gonna do that right now because it's easier to see what I'm doing. Little disclaimer. <clears throat> um, so the, our first wrap, we're gonna go around one side of that, this pressure bar, tighten it down. Second wrap, we're gonna go around the other side of the pressure bar. We've now captured this bandage in place. Now we can bring the, the bandage around and pass it through this pressure bar, and then we're gonna bring it back upon itself and kind of a change of direction. Now this is push, putting more pressure down over the wound, and then we can continue to wrap over that. Another thing that you can do is you can put a twist in the bandage directly over that pressure bar. That'll add even more pressure. And then if, if this person is, say, walking wounded in an MCI or uh, is, is ambulatory, something that you can do is, is just bring this bandage around and secure it to itself. And now the patient's been, been bandaged but now also has a sling. Or you can, you can wrap it around the chest. But if you're just gonna be using this bandage and wrapping it all the way around the, the extremity, continuing to really pull all that slack out on every wrap that you're doing. If, I mean, you can effectively make this thing a, a tourniquet if you, if you pull it tight enough, but 
And then at the very end, there's this closure bar that has two tabs, and they've got some teeth on them, so all you have to do is just pass that over the, the bandage, and that's going to secure in place. It's going to grab, grab and uh, secure in place. Doing a <clears throat> compression bandage with the normal ACE wrap and a, a 5x9 gauze pad. Basically, it's going to be the same, although it doesn't have the pressure bar or the closure strap. So there's just a few ch changes. You could either use the 5x9 or the bulky dressing, place it, and then you're going to have to really keep your progress with, with uh, pressure. Otherwise, this thing's just going to unravel and, and shoot out. So your first couple wraps might not be real tight just because you're trying to get this in place. But really wrap on both sides of the bandage with your first couple of wraps. And then once you've got the bandage secure, then you can really pull that extra elastic out of this bandage and really start tightening it down for your, for your compression. Um, you, can, you can do that twist in the bandage, and that's going to help to uh, put that you know, downward pressure on. And then you can just continue. I cannot keep this door closed. Um, you're going to continue to wrap this, pulling all that slack out as you go. And then when you get to the end, you can either just tie a knot in this and stuff it underneath one of those wraps, and that'll hold it in place. Or there's Velcro on this end to just secure it to itself on this bandage. And then it's, it's in place. This is going to help. This ACE wrap will uh, we'll absorb some blood, but uh, mainly it's, it's on here as compression. You can get so much more compression out of these bandages than you can with just normal standard Curlex or, or Coban. Uh, another benefit of these is wrapping head injuries because of the, <coughs> the, the tightness of the bandage. It's going to stay in place a lot better than the Curlex that tends to sort of just cone off of the, the head and you have to end up wrapping around the chin and holding it in place. These bandages are going to stay where you place them. So you can really dress the bandage as you do your wraps because the tighter you pull, the more the bandage is going to want to bunch up. So you can just kind of dress it as you, as you go and lay it flat. So that's kind of the, uh, the big, um, the, 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 an overview on how to use these different bandages. So now we'll just go over a real rapid blood sweep and... Um, and then as we, as we go and identify injuries, we'll treat those. So we'll just uh, kind of make these bandages that are already placed out of sight, out of mind. And then, um, and then we'll start doing our, our rapid blood sweep. I'm going to kind of just go through it systematically. Obviously, I'd have gloves on. And uh, you, you, know, you may consider wearing two pairs of gloves in case you get the first one real bloody on your first blood sweep, you can pull those off and because we're really looking for, for blood, not just feeling for it. So, and then you have a, a fresh set. So <clears throat> with your blood sweep, we're going to do just a real rapid head to toe and, and we're just looking for that massive bleeding. The March principles, the M stands for massive bleeding. So we're going to start at the head and you're just going to really quick sweep over the head going over the back of the head, through the hair, and then the back of the neck, check your hands. If, uh, if you don't have significant blood on your hands, you're going to continue to go. Normally on our assessment, we work our way from the head to the toe, doing the head first and then the chest, and then um, working our way down the legs, come back up and do the arms. With the rapid blood sweep, we're going to do this a little different. If this is a patient that you suspect there's penetrating trauma or significant bleeding, we're going to do the extremities before the chest, and the reason for that is we can quick, quickly apply a tourniquet and control that bleeding. So we're going to do the extremities and then the chest. So we do our head, and then we're going to do one extremity. You basically want to encompass the arm or the extremity with your hand as best you can and slide your hands down so that you're covering the whole thing. So sweep along the, the arm, check your hand. Sweep along this arm, check your hands. They're clear. So now I'm going to do the legs. I'm going to sweep this leg. It's clear. Now I'm going to sweep this leg. 
we'll say I, I find a, a huge amount of blood. I see um, that there's an arterial bleed down here. It's pumping blood out. I can kneel down on that femoral artery to temporarily control that bleeding. I'm going to get my tourniquet out. Just for uh, the, the ease of viewing, I'm going to run with the strap going inside. But again, you typically want to have the strap facing outward just because it makes it easier to secure. Bring the tourniquet up high and tight. I'm going to, we're doing the leg, so we're going to go through the second part of the buckle. We're going to remove all of the slack out of here, secure it to itself. And then I'm going to start to tighten the windlass strap or bar here. And I'm going to continue to go until I can't tighten it anymore. Secure it in place. Got a little tail here that we can tuck under there, keep it from blowing out, and then write our time. Now we've controlled this bleeding. We're not even going to look at the injury right now because uh, we want to make sure that we have all bleeding controlled. We're going to come up, make sure we've got the, the neck and the inguinal area um, up, kind of up in the major vessel area up here underneath the collarbones. And then we're going we're gonna to check the chest, running down the chest, also checking that, that axillary area underneath the armpits where a lot of injuries get missed. Check your hands, slide down over the abdomen. We're going to roll our patient, and now we're going to check the back, doing our blood sweep, looking for blood, and then the pelvis area. If uh, when we do that, we find that this patient has a penetrating injury to the chest, you can place a gloved hand over that initially. That's going to help to seal that. And then we're going to want to remove our, uh, our chest seal, get this out. Have, have a partner hopefully do this or have your partner hold in that seal. You want to remove this backing off the, the adhesive part of this bandage. This is the Asherman chest seal, vented seal. Place with the vent over the wound and then just lay it in place. If there's a lot of blood there, you can use some gauze to just wipe that clean uh, just to try to get a better um, adherence to the the skin. The other option is using a defib pad. This one says expired chest seal just to help people know why there's a defib pad in there. And then just cut the, the cable off and draw an X over it. If we have a, a, um, pen, a, a exit wound sorry, on the back, we may place the vented seal on the front and then roll the patient and place this defib pad on the exit wound on the back or you could do the defib pads. With these, since they're not vented, if you place it, you may have to burp it. Uh, we're gonna have a video of uh, how to do these um, techniques here in a little bit. So you've placed this, this uh, chest seal. So I did my full blood sweep, placed the tourniquet. Uh, obviously, if there's more responders on scene, you can be dealing with these injuries simultaneously if you need to. But um, I ident identified that injury there and rather than wait and, and uh, until we get to the respiration phase of March principles. If you do see a hole in the chest, obviously you can cover that up and, uh, and control it. So we've done our massive bleeding. Now we're gonna go on to the A, of, uh, which is airway. So we're gonna evaluate the airway. Is it adequate? Is it clear? Do I need to, uh, to secure this airway somehow? We'll say that this patient um, does not have these injuries that, that you're seeing right now, but and that, that the uh, airway is clear and stable. So then we're going to go on to the R, which is respirations. Now we're going to evaluate the rate, quality, the depth of this patient's breathing. Is it adequate? Do we need to assist ventilations, put oxygen on this patient right now? Do we need to deal with this chest injury? We already did. Now we need to consider chest decompression. <clears throat> Remember, if we've decompressed uh, one side of the chest, and we are manually ventilating this patient, we need to decompress the other side of the chest, adequately have, have uh, ventilation, um, since we're supporting ventilations, or if we intubate this person. Once we've uh, dealt with these chest injuries, now we can go on to circulation, which is uh, the C in the March principles. Now we're going to come down here, and we're going to bandage this wound and any other wounds that we found, whether we're doing it with compression, dressing or cling or, uh, 
or direct pressure, whatever we choose to do. We're also going to evaluate, is this tourniquet effective or do we need to add one? And we'll have a, a video here in a little bit to uh, segment to show um, doing the wound packing, but basically it's the inguinal areas and then the axillary areas. Too high on the extremity to, uh, to control bleeding with a tourniquet, so we, ne we need to do it by other means. And then remember that the chest and thoracic cavity is, is uh, an open cavity, so we're not just going to blindly pack gauze into those wounds. And then we're going to go on to uh, head and hypothermia, so we're going to identify um, this, this patient's mental status, and their GCS, and then we're also going to uh, help prevent any um, hypothermia. So keeping this patient covered, you know, we're hot, we're working, but, but we may have just removed all of the clothing off of this person. So we want to uh, make sure that we're preventing hypothermia when we, you know, if, if it's uh, indicated. And the earlier you start doing that, obviously the better. So we've, we've done our rapid blood sweep looked for uh, any significant hemorrhage. Then we did airway, respirations, circulation, and then we did hypothermia and head. Uh, in, in the circulation part, if we identify that this patient has uh, abdominal injury, we'll say that this, we see an abdominal evisceration. There's a couple different techniques for, uh, for dealing with this, but a good little trick that you can do is, is take the plastic packaging off of a Curlix wrap, and some of them are small, pretty small, but if you just have a small loop of bowel, which is the typical um, abdominal evisceration, you can just lay this, this piece of plastic over that and tape it down, and now you've basically turned this thing into kind of a colostomy bag. It's going gonna, it's gonna to remain moist. That, that loop of bowel is going to not get um, hypothermic, you know, and, and so you're going to keep it warm, moist, and protected. And then if you want, you can lay a very loose dressing over this. But that's just a, a kind of a good little trick on, on how to deal with a small part of a bowel um, or a loop of bowel that's, that's eviscerated out of the abdomen. Another uh, thing that we're going to look for is eye injuries. If this patient has a, a significant eye injury that we need to bandage, one of the big things that really contributes to uh, a poor outcome with the eye is the increased ocular pressure uh, when there's an eye injury. So if we can prevent that from happening, prevent pressure on the eye, we can really help that eye um, have a successful outcome. Uh, so we, we do carry the, the small eye gauze eye pad that we can lay over, but you know we all learn to, to find a, a cup or something to place over to protect the eye. Those are hard to find on scenes typically. So that's why we carry the eye protection in the trauma kit. Something you can do is, is um, if, if you have some bleeding or an eye that's, that's come out of the socket, you can just place the eye pad over that very loosely. And then you can place the eye protection glasses on. And there's about an inch of clearance between the, the eye that is in the socket and the glass, so, so you're, you're going to protect that eye from getting pressure on it. Once you've done that, it's over both eyes, what you can do is, is use some ace wrap or uh, curlex, and you can wrap over the, the eyes or the glasses. Obviously, you don't want to cover the nose, but you can just wrap these glasses in place. That way, the patient's not looking around and uh, you're, you're preventing any further injury from happening. As you can see, I'm, I'm really not even making this, this uh, ace wrap tight, and it's staying really well on the head. On a person, not a mannequin that's rubber, but on a person, this is even going to stay in place better than, than uh, on here. So you can see it's a lot more effective than the Curlix. And then you've got the Velcro closure that we can put in place and cover that. We already talked about uh, how to use that, that burn face mask. You can pour some saline in there and, and then place it. Uh, some of the kits have the, a, a burn sheet in there in place of the second trauma dressing. I don't think that's a bad idea. And, uh, but really, the burn sheet in a burn patient, our initial on-scene management really should be get to obviously stop the burning and then get the clothes removed. And then typically, we lay that burn sheet on the gurney 
and then place the patient on there. So uh, that's kind of more leading to the transport phase that we have that burn sheet on the gurney and, and place our patient on there and then wrap them up in it. So that's why you might not find one in the trauma kit and you might have to get it from the ambulance once it's arrived. One other thing that I want to talk about is the other type of tourniquet that we have in our triage bag is this ratchet tourniquet. And uh, really, it, it's most effective, it seems like, on larger patients and um, on the lower extremity, but it can be used on an upper extremity. Uh, we have one of these in the triage bag, as well as two of the cat tourniquets in there. So this, this has a, a small buckle here that you can see, and it's a lot easier if you can just slide it up rather than removing it and going through the buckle. But then it has this pull tab here, so you just, on the strap it says one pull, and then this is some just backward pressure. Remove all that slack out of there, just like in the cat tourniquet. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we have this ratchet here with a number two down there. And so once we've removed all the slack out of this tourniquet, then we can just lift this ratchet and it's gonna, that's how we're gonna get our pressure. It doesn't, from studies I've read, it does not provide quite as good of circumferential pressure as the cat tourniquet or some of the other tourniquets on the market, but I, th I think it is still effective. One of the other downsides of this is this orange button here is how you, you remove this tourniquet so it can inadvertently be pressed and, uh, and that just blows out the tourniquet and now you've lost all of your pressure. So I think that the cat tourniquet is a little more aggressive and, and a little more effective at staying in place. So That concludes uh, the training that we have on these trauma kits. Obviously open it up, spend, spend some time before you actually need this equipment in a high stress situation to get to know the changes that we have and look in. We have uh, several training kits that are set up so that you can um, actually get some hands-on skills and um, good luck. So try and get direct pressure on it, kind of get eyes on it, scoop out any excess fluid. Just keep on doing this until it's full. Keep it. See you, Bob. See you, Bob. Pressure on that point. Oh, that's gotta hurt. Okay. And once you get the cavity full. You can even use uh, whatever's left in here. Make it a little bigger. And here, three minutes direct pressure. Okay. No peaking. No peaking. And if you're using the quick clot stuff, you can use this as a thermal barrier. So this is the management of uh, penetrating chest trauma. Um, we're simulating skin with this chucks pad and then underneath we have um, a rib cage that has a nine millimeter gunshot wound that um, has gone through the bone. There's a large wound cavity there that's going to be a lot bigger than the entrance wound. Got bone and bullet fragments. And then a large exit wound that, um, that has quite a bit of uh, bullet fragmentation and there would be a lot of it within the, the chest cavity. All that bone went somewhere. So the first thing that we're gonna do to manage this is um, start with just a gloved hand to cover that, that wound. And then we can use a chest seal. Expired defib pad. Place directly over the wound. This can be burped uh, to relieve a tension pneumothorax or we can decompress the chest. So with uh, chest decompression, we've got um, a couple different size needles. This is the regular angiocath. It's about a, a two inch needle, 14 gauge. This is the cook needle that's a little bit longer. 
And then this is the ARS needle that's three and a quarter inches. They're all 14 gauge. So um, to uh, get, get a positive response that you're in the, um, in the pleural space, you can take a syringe uh, with sterile water, sterile saline, and uh, just draw up a small amount and then place that on your needle. And then <clears throat> starting from, from the head being up here, we're gonna go uh, mid-clavicular line to the second intercostal space counting down. So directly over the third rib. And we're gonna just wanna ride over that rib. So right now, because there's negative pressure in the syringe with the, the stopper, um, the, the saline's not gonna flow out. It's good to put some tension on the skin and then just make a small incision into the skin with the, the needle that'll help uh, to allow the catheter to advance um, and, and kind of decrease the resistance. So we're gonna go over the rib. Once we're in the chest wall but haven't passed into the pleural space yet, we can remove the stopper on the syringe and then we're gonna continue to advance the needle. You'll find a, a decrease in resistance and know that you're in the pleural space. Don't advance the needle anymore. Uh, what you may have is some bubbles um, coming up through the fluid, which would indicate that uh, you've relieved some of the pressure, but oftentimes there will be a large or a small uh, tissue or some sort of a, a little plug inside the needle. So we're gonna wanna clear that. So we're just gonna bump it so put the, the syringe or the stopper back into the syringe and push that through. And that's gonna force that um, the uh, plug out of there. And then you may get some bubbling that comes up. Remove the, the needle and then advance the catheter um, until you meet any resistance. You can stop there. The catheter doesn't have to go all the way into the hub and then you can just place, leave it there to indicate that you decompress the chest. If, uh, if the patient starts to develop a tension pneumo later on, what you can do is uh, take a syringe and get a little saline in there again and attach it and see if, if it's um, developed like a blood clot inside the catheter and you can force that out again and then see if that, if that relieves. Otherwise, you might have to repeat the chest decompression or burp the seal.